welcome to this episode of Hank's Corner. I'm Hank Jr., part of Hank Jr. Productions, where I'm documenting life's moments through photography, videography, and now podcasting. And tonight I have a very special guest. She is familiar with Broadway in Nashville and Broadway in New York. Please welcome Brooke Moribor. Brooke, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm glad to have you on here. So tell us, where are you calling in from? Uh, New York, New York, Greenwich Village, where I grew up, and I just moved back into my hometown neighborhood. <laughs> okay. And so that's your new studio that you've been talking about online, correct? It is. I mean, it's it's on its way to being fully built out, but it is functional. <laughs> and, and that seems like a lot of what people are doing more is kind of building their little studios uh, inside their homes just because of some of the restrictions is ca- keeping us from going out. And the same thing with me, you know, I have a little bit, uh, you know, Harry Potter closet here where I do my broadcast and everybody else is kind of, you know, doing the same thing. You got the cool backdrop, though, so you could be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to give props to my wife. She's the one who uh, made that. Uh, nice. so, and, and, speak, and speaking about my wife, I have to bring this up because you are, uh, 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 you know, from Broadway in New York. And uh, one of the uh, first things that you ever did was Les Mis. And that is one of my wife's favorite shows. And not only that, uh, I heard that you auditioned with a song uh, from American Tale which is also one of her favorite, uh, you know, cartoons. So tell me a little bit about that and how you got started uh, with uh, with the Broadway. Well, first of all, I have to meet your wife because we sound like <laughs> kindred spirits. <laughs> Les Miserables is my favorite Broadway show as well, not just because I was in it, but I just, that music, the minute the orchestra kicks in, it just makes your, get butterflies to this day, I still do. Yeah, but, it's definitely um, a powerful show. So how did how did you come across, uh, you know, auditioning for that? So I was a very loud child, always singing. And <laughs> my mom actually used to be an actress and a singer, and she gave it up to raise a kid and have a normal life. And one day my parents came home with the CD for Les Miserables, and they popped it into the stereo system. They uh, put on Castle on a Cloud with the little girl singing. And I was like, wait, I want to do that. I want to be little Cosette. Why can't I do that? And I kind of got this idea in my brain that it's possible to actually be a professional performer at a very young age. And uh, my parents had had a couple of friends and family over for Christmas. And I got up and sang in front of everyone. I was a very outgoing child, which is completely the opposite of who I am as an adult now. (laughs) I'm kind of shy now, which is kind of funny, but um, I just got up and sang for everybody. And my mom's best friend said, you know, I have a cousin who is a manager for kids and I think you should maybe introduce them. So like you said, I sang uh, somewhere out there from American Tale over the phone for her. And she said to me, you know, you sound like you could play little Cosette. And immediately I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I would like to get an audition for it. And uh, my both of my parents were like, oh no, this is starting. You know, they just didn't want me to get my heart broken the way that my mom did. My dad also used to play the drums. He played the drums once at Carnegie Hall and my mom was on Broadway and she was also in The Godfather for a second and one of The Godfathers and ended up on the cutting room floor. So they didn't want me to deal with any of that, but I begged them to let me audition. I auditioned and I got it. It should always be that easy. (laughs) 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 But being being that young, because you were like eight years old, right? At that mm -hmm. time. So how did, how were you, like you said, you were, you know, you were you're more shy now than you were back then but how was it on stage as an eight-year-old I mean were you nervous at all or how how does that work so I didn't even know what nerves were at that point but the minute that I got on stage behind the scrim which there's a there's a turntable in Les Miserables that the whole show kind of turns around the entire time and there's a scrim in the middle of the stage and it pulls up when the next scene comes in and little Cosette starts it sweeping and I started sweeping. I heard the music for the cue. And then this new feeling came into my system that I'd never experienced before of panic. And 
I could just feel the energy of the audience. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I almost ran off the stage. And the stage manager literally pushed me by my butt with broom in hand. <laughs> like, mm. you gotta go on, we gotta go on. And this little tiny eight-year-old just being like scooched onto the stage, like as the scrim is starting to come up. And just before you could see me, I was there and I'm like, oh, there's the audience. And I just went and I started going. And the minute I opened my mouth and started singing, I knew it was home and the nerves went away, which was so crazy. Wow. And it hasn't changed. I still get very nervous before important. It, I mean, every performance is important, but performances that I think are very important. I get butterflies in my stomach and sometimes feel like I want to throw up. I'm so nervous. But the minute I get on stage, it's gone. And I just feel more at home than I do in my own skin in real life. Okay. So then I guess it's kind of like a natural talent then just something that just happens that, you know, like you say, you don't really have control over, but once you do, you feel like you're in, at home. Yeah. The anxiety is part of the natural talent. And then there's the talent part. <laughs> It's <laughs> and, so, and so tell me, other than Lay Miz, what were some of the other things that you did? Because uh, I, I know even before that, you did some stuff with, uh, you know, the local theater and stuff. Uh, so yeah. what were some of the other shows you were in? I did seven Broadway shows as like a kid slash young adult. So I was very, very blessed to be part of this Broadway theater community that, you know, felt like a family. I did, uh, gosh, I did a, I did a show called The Wild Party once, which was a, one of my favorite ones, which is kind of a little bit out there, but uh, I got to play this really cool role. Uh, I got to work with Cindy Lauper in the Three Penny Opera. And um, I did some off-Broadway shows that allowed me to show my acting chops and not just singing sometimes, which was cool, and some film and TV stuff. But I uh, really, it's so, it's so funny. It feels like a lifetime ago now since I made the transition. And I actually, I think it was about five or six years ago, I stepped into my agent's office and I said, stop sending me on theater auditions. I can't do that. Travel back and forth to Nashville and try to focus on my recording career. Basically can't have any creativity left if I'm doing Broadway musicals and I'm rehearsing from 10 to six during the day for the next show on my lunch hour auditioning for what might be a year from that and then on my dinner hour having physical therapy for the aches and pains of dancing on stage eight shows a week and then perform at night there's no time to be creative for anything else so uh i was really really scared about walking into his office and telling him that but he had been very supportive and understood what I was doing and trying to have a recording career that whole time. And he gave me his blessing. I said, you can still send me on some TV and film stuff. I can juggle that. But uh, probably a couple of weeks later, I think it was I actually walked into his office and said, you know what, I'm, I'm done. I'm like going to spend most of my time in Nashville right now. And I don't want to waste your time. And he was, and the whole rest of the Broadway theater community. So they have been so supportive of this decision that I've made. And uh, I, it was the scariest, one of the scariest decisions I've ever made in my life because I had a real support system there. And, a, you know, I had my health insurance for the rest of my life through the Cobra plan at Actors Equity, but I let it go because yeah, I that was my dream. That, yeah. that was definitely a, a turning point and, you know, that you said you started to focus more on your music career, but given the chance, you know, just even if it's just for fun to think about if you could go back and, and, and do another, you know, play, would you do it? And, and if so, which one would be your favorite one to, to do? Oh, there's a lot. There's so many. Um, I've always wanted to play Fontaine in Les Miserables. So I would go back and do that. Uh, I would love to pull a Sarah Bareilles one day and write my own Broadway musical and star in it like Waitress. Uh, I'd love to, you know, that could be like, you know, get to the level I want to be as a recording artist and then do something like that. Uh, there's, there's so many Broadway shows that I would love to do one day. Okay. And then as far as your music career, 2021 ended on a very high note for you. I mean, you had, uh, you know, Hard Candy Christmas that you were playing out that was doing really well. Uh, I saw that you were, you know, had a, a, a people uh, interview that you were in and, you know, something like 200,000 streams. And so 2021, you, you have to be happy about how, how that ended. I, you know, it's been a really tough couple of years for all of us, 
but in a way I feel like I don't feel like I'm the only artist who has this to say, but I think I've been more creative than ever and more successful in what I'm doing because it's kind of, you know, for example, it's forced me to make my own home studio. It's forced me to feel like I have to be able to do everything myself. And my creative juices in 2020 were flowing so much because you're stuck in the apartment, not knowing when you're going to be able to leave when you're in the middle of New York City. And I ended up writing some of my best music during 2020 and released it in 2021. So I'm so proud of it. And uh, This Town Made Us is the single that I released. It's my first release with Reviver Records as an artist with them. Uh, and I, I feel like that song, it means so much to me because it's about the two towns that have made me who I am and that's New York City and Nashville, just like you were saying, it's like one Broadway to the other Broadway. And I was inspired by, I had just landed back in New York City in 2020 in March when the, no, it was the end of February, when the tornado hit Nashville and it was devastating. And I just saw all of my friends in Nashville, like a lot of people lose their homes and I had literally missed it by a day and landed back in New York City only to find that New York City had just been hit by the pandemic and our hospitals were being overrun. And it was a devastating time for me to see what both of my places that I consider home were going through. But at the same time, they both just embodied everything that I try to write about in my music. And that's strength and resilience and overcoming and, uh, so I ended up getting on a Zoom call with my two friends, Bill Z. Luigi and Cassandra Kabinsky. And I had just read an article about from the New York Post saying that New York City is dead. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure you had seen probably a bunch of those. You're, you're in Florida, right? That's correct. I think even out in Florida, you guys are seeing all the, you know, all the headlines about New York City is dead. And uh, I mean, honestly, come on. <laughs> New York City doesn't die. You, mm -hmm. you know, you we built it back bigger, better, and stronger. That's just what we are. We are the definition of resilience. So that was the catalyst for me getting on this phone call with my two friends and saying, you know what? I want to write a song about my hometown. And I also want to write it about Nashville a little bit because Nashville's become my second home. So uh, we kind of wrote, um, I'm not allowed to curse on this broadcast, am I? <laughs> I'll edit it out if need be. We wrote an F U letter to the guy of the New York Post, but instead turned it around into something beautiful and inspiring about the people who stayed in these towns and the idea of, you know, hometown pride and being proud of your roots and that where you come from has helped make you who you are as a human being. So that's how I feel about being a native New Yorker and also what Nashville has done for me is, as a person and an artist as well. Yeah. And you said, I, I went on a tangent. I have no idea what you just asked me. <laughs> the, the, no, you're right on. And and you mentioned resilience a couple of times. And that was actually the word that I was thinking of, you know, when, when I heard that. So let's go ahead and play this town made us here on Hank's corner. If it makes you feel better, go and kick us when we're down. We can take a hard hit and still get up off the ground. Don't you know the way this goes? We go high when you go low. We get high.
Welcome back to Hank's Corner. I'm Hank Jr. here with Brooke Moribor. And that was uh, This Town Made Us, uh, as I said, a song about resilience. And, uh, you know, that word also kind of describes you uh, during the transition period of, of moving from uh, Broadway to, uh, to you know, music. And, and I'd love for you to be able to tell that story here, if you don't mind, about how, how you made that transition and as well some of the things that you had to face and overcome. Well, I started writing music uh, when I was very young and uh, I was diagnosed with a rare eye disease. I lost my eyesight for four years when I was a teenager and I woke up one morning. I couldn't see my face in the mirror. It was just shapes and colors and blobs. And uh, I went immediately to the emergency room. My mom took me and uh, they basically said, you know, unless you take heavy doses of chemotherapy, drugs, and steroids, you will go completely blind, and you're basically going to have to live with not seeing, you know, for the rest of your life. And I wasn't in complete darkness, but I couldn't see. I could tell if a person was in front of me, but that was about it. And the medications were almost as bad as the disease itself. So... I was 14 when this happened and my parents were also going through a brutal divorce and custody battle. So it was kind of, everything was happening all at once in my life. And I had gone from having this really wonderful, you know, childhood and then everything falling apart. And I, you know, it was, I think it would be even difficult for an adult to go through now but as a child the feeling of isolation and the the realization that oh my gosh mommy and daddy can't fix everything and the doctors can't fix it there's like immediately you grow up and you realize that the only person who can do something about anything the only person who's going through what you're going through is you Mm -hmm. so uh my friends too young to understand what was going on so like i said it was very isolated and isolating and I found my best friend, which was songwriting. And that was what got me through because every emotion that I was feeling, I could pour it into it and have a reason for it. I also learned how to meditate at a very young age. And I was inquisitive with the doctors, just asking them what exactly is going on in my eyes. I want to know because I didn't believe that I was never going to get my eyesight back. They told me that but I didn't believe I was going to live with this forever. And there's something about your gut, you know. And mm-hmm. I used to meditate. It was kind of like a video game where I would imagine in a dark room that I was killing all the bad cells in my eyes. It would be like, boom, boom, pow, pow, pow. <laughs> I would just sit there. Um, so that and songwriting got me through to four years later, going into the doctor's office in remission and shocking the doctors. So I am a very firm believer in that the human spirit is stronger than we actually think and we can surprise ourselves. And uh, that's, that was the, the thing that I took with me that I said, you know what? I am a songwriter. I am an artist. I'm not just an actor who plays a part on Broadway and, 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 you know, entertains and sings. And as much as I love doing that, I feel like I have my job on this earth is to spread this message with other people and help other people heal through what they're going through. So that was one of the main deciding factors. I want to be a recording artist. 
Mm -hmm. And I had heard you talk about before, you know, while you're on stage, you're playing a character, but when you got into the music and after all this had transpired, you know, it kind of forced you to be real and kind of authentic and tell me how that transition was. Was that something that was natural because of what was happening or did you still fight, you know, having to open up to the world? Oh, it was not natural at all. I lived most of my life growing up hiding behind characters and playing characters and using my emotions to get there. But like I said, I'm, I'm actually quite a shy person. So it felt more comfortable for me to pretend to be somebody else, but draw on things that have happened to me in my life so that I could connect with that character and then not, not be eye to eye with the audience, not see them, not communicate with them. But with the music, I had to learn that the reason, you know, remind myself the reason I did this is because I want to connect with people. I want to connect on a very, very deep level with people. So it took a while for me to get used to even just singing in small clubs and actually looking at people in the eye. And now it's an absolute thrill and I don't even know any other way to be, you know, on stage performing my music for people. I have to look at them. I have to connect with them. It's just part of it. Um, but now that's that now that has become my comfort zone, which is so freeing to me because it, like you said, it's being real. It's not being something else. And it, for me, I feel completely, I feel love when I do that because I put every, I put all of myself into my music and mm -hmm. there's people out there connecting to it. And that just makes me feel more connected to the human race than you ever could possibly feel. Okay. And you, ultimately weren't uh, doing so much, uh, you know, country. And e even now it's a little bit kind of popish country. Uh, but in general, it's still kind of country. Did you feel that you were drawn to country? Because a lot of people say country is a way to be able to tell stories. And was that something that brought you over? Or was it just maybe something else? Yeah, you know, I always say I feel like country music found me. But I did find Nashville because a manager of mine had sent me over there for some co-writes. And from the first day I was there, I fell in love with the town and I wasn't sure how it was gonna go because I, I thought they were gonna be, you know, not so receptive to this New York City girl who writes country music, you know. But instead, you know, I remember from my first writing session, they were like, yes, you're from New York City, something different, this is awesome. And uh, I just, so quickly made a family out there. And I, you know, for me, yes, country music, it is storytelling. And that's what I'm trying to do with trying to communicate with my audience and listeners. So Nashville felt like the right place for me. And I had traveled back and forth to LA a few times, which I also love, love the beach. But um, just Nashville felt a little bit almost like where I grew up because I grew up in Greenwich Village in Manhattan, which isn't like the rest of Manhattan. It's kind of like a little more know, cozy and little cozy. Everybody knows each other. And, you know, uh, and it just felt like Nashville felt a little bit like Greenwich Village to me, you know, just a one big family. Okay. And one of your earlier songs, you know, when you, when you got there was Cry Like a Girl. Tell us a little bit about that song. That is a song that I wrote with my friend Billy Seidman in New York. Um, and I had this idea for a song that I wanted to write called Cry Like a Girl. And I wanted to, to kind of flip the idea that being emotional was a sign of weakness. And it was you know, Billy and I worked really, really hard on that song. It wasn't one of those that came really quickly because the message could be so misconstrued. And I wanted people to see this as a song of strength that for me, I think crying is a way of cleansing so that you can say, okay, I'm gonna pick myself up, dust myself off and move on to the next thing rather than holding on to the emotions, letting it fester and, you know, not being able to move on. So. Uh, so it's a it's a song about strength and female empowerment, male empowerment. You know, everybody just, you know, cry. 
because it's not it's not a sign of weakness. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and play Cry Like a Girl here on Hank's Corner. Welcome back to Hank's Corner. I'm Hank Jr. And that was Cry Like a Girl by Brooke Morabor. Now, I have to ask you this, though, because uh, this particular, um, uh, I guess, uh, animal kind of shows up in almost as many posts as you you and your social media. Tell us a little bit about Sherlock. <laughs> I haven't had an interview in a while where someone's asking about him. So, yay. <laughs> Just stop me if I talk too much. Um <laughs> Sherlock, love of my life. He is, he's now about seven years old. He's a floppy eared rabbit. With, they're called Holland Lops. He is very, very smart, uh, litter box trained, free range, no cage. Uh, and uh, he is just, uh, he's like having a dog slash cat. Very, very smart. I mean, people don't realize that rabbits are actually very smart animals. And he he loves when I play the guitar. He tries to, I have to get a video of him doing it. And I haven't gotten it yet. But he tries to put his chin on the tuning knobs because he thinks mm. that's what's making the sound. So I'll sit on the couch. I'll hop on the couch and I'll start trying to do the tuning knobs. It's just really cute. Uh, but yeah, he's just, he's just great. I just, the hardest thing about traveling back and forth to Nashville, to New York, is that I usually leave him in the city because he doesn't love traveling and my heart breaks and mama cries before she goes every single time, but he's used to it. <laughs> yeah, and I find this post, you know, pretty cool because, you know, when I first moved out, um, you know, I wasn't able to have a dog where I was and I actually did get a floppy-eared bunny as well and I, I named him... 
I'm serious. And, you know, I know it, it may not seem too manly to a lot of people, but I did have a bunny and uh, I no, didn't name him. That's super manly. <laughs> that's as manly as it gets. <laughs> and I named and I named a peanut bunny. And uh, so he was not a musician like yours is aspiring to be. But, uh, you know, he was enjoyable to have around. And uh, so when I when I do see those posts, you know, I think that it's kind of cute. So I just had to ask you about that. <laughs> so here we are now in 2022. We're already a month in. Um, what are some of your goals and aspirations for this year? Just continue making great music. I have a bunch of songs that have been recorded already. They're kind of sitting and waiting to be released, which I can't wait for everybody to hear. Uh, one of them is coming out February 18th. So that's right around the corner. It's called Down to Nothing. So I'll be posting a lot of my socials and Spotify about that. And uh, 2022, just getting back to live playing. You know, I have a live gig coming up on February 17th at Whiskey Jam for anyone who's in Nashville. And I uh, just want to continue being able to safely perform live with people. It's been so hard not to be able to do that and just, you know, really connect and not just connect over the computer with people in online concerts. Yeah, because they, they, they can only go so far. far. And actually, they were kind of cool for a while because it almost brought, you know, a lot more fans that could not be able to, you know, see you to be able to watch that. But like you said, now you're used to seeing that eye contact. You, you, you love the crowd's reaction. And I know the artists just really want to be out there in front of a crowd. Definitely. It's always so strange when you're doing an online concert and then you finish the song. And you're like, OK, I'll applaud for myself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope 2022 is very successful for you. And, you know, if you ever make it down here to Florida, you know, by all means, I'd love to actually see you live. But uh, I appreciate you coming on, being a guest here on Hank's Corner. You're more than welcome to be a guest anytime. Thank you so much for having me. And gosh, I wish I was in Florida right now. It's so cold in New York. <laughs>